We have an extremely exciting and interesting designer to come and speak with us, Billy Whitehouse. She really has pioneered the concept of wearable technology, something I think that India is, um, I don't know, not even introduced to, I think, at this point. So she's going to talk about that. There's plenty of exciting stuff that she's done, many awards, a long list as well, and uh, interesting verticals as well. She's gone into sports and done something like the alert shirt, and she's also gone into um, arenas such as nature and um, outdoor wear. So I think I'm going to wind down introductions and get her to come on stage and tell you more. A very warm round of applause, please. We're very honored to have with us, Philly. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It's very much an honor to be here. Um, so this is actually my first time to India, um, and it's been phenomenal so far. I've only been here a max of about six hours. Um, but I'm really privileged to be able to be up on stage with you and tell you a little bit about me and about my journey and how I got to be on stage. Um, we, we started wearable experiments three and a half years ago, um, and my background is in design education. My mother started a design school in Australia, um, which is called the White House Institute of Design, um, and we've been teaching design education for 25 years. Um, I'm not that old. She started it when I was born. Um, and it's been an amazing journey watching design change um, and watching fashion change and watching how you have to educate and how you have to evolve. Um, and it really is now about designing for humans in a digital age. Um, and it's about this physical digital relationship. Um, so thinking about what it means to be truly human and designing for that experience. Um, so I'm going to talk about what we do um, and how I have won a few awards. Um, and our journey really started in, in quite a risque area. So we built a product for Durex, the condom company. And the product was called Funderwear. And believe it or not, it is vibrating knickers for couples in long-distance relationships. <laughs> yes, it is rather risque. Uh, but what we learned to do is we learned to make technology soft. We learned to make it personal, and we learned to make it about connecting humans. So that is exactly what technology is about. It's about human-to-human -human connection, and it always has been. Uh, and for some reason, we've got away from that with having our tablets, with having our screens, and we are totally dominated by our terminal devices. So what my mission in life is actually to bring technology back to human-to-human -to -human connection and what makes us truly human. So following the success of Funderware, where we had 8 million hits on YouTube, 55,000 requests for the product, and we won a Can Lion, uh, which is a creativity award, um, we then took the company to America. And we decided that we had so much success with this, we needed to explore more about how we could use technologies in different ways, and that we're intuitive and that we're useful. Um, so when I moved to America, I moved to New York City, and I got extremely lost. Even though it's a grid, it's still very confusing. Um, you get out of a subway station, you don't know which way you're facing, it's north or south, e east or west. Um, and so I ended up staring down at my phone for a good six months, learning the map, just constantly looking down. I nearly got hit by taxis, I nearly got hit by other people. It was actually quite a, like a hazardous problem. Um, so we built a product which is called the Navigate Jacket. And instead of having to stare down at your phone, you upload from your smartphone where you'd like to travel to, and then you put your phone back in your bag or back in your pocket, and the jacket will tap you on the shoulder when to turn left, when to turn right, and then double time when you arrive. Extremely useful on a bicycle. I've actually had people in Amsterdam write to me from the other side of the world saying, please send me this jacket. I just had this awful moment where my phone died and I was on a bike and I had no idea where to go. Uh, so this is a way for us using technology in a really intuitive way. This is the video.
done is we've created city-specific jackets where the electronics are removable and rechargeable. We've also built an induction charge coat hanger so that you can just hang up your jacket at the end of the day and it'll naturally charge because there's nothing worse than thinking about charging another device. The coat hanger touches the jacket and it, touches by it charges by induction. We've made them city-specific, so we've made a New York, a London, a Paris, and a Sydney. This is the Paris jacket that we released at Paris Fashion Week last year. So following the success of that, we really started deep diving into this exploration of what is going to be the future. Um, is it going to be stylish? Is it going to have that sense of nostalgia? Or is it going to be this sci-fi film? My version of the future is actually far more like a Harry Potter film than it is a sci-fi film. So we've got to have the magic of technology, but you've still got to have that essence of nostalgia where we want to adopt it. And I think that's really relevant for an Indian culture. So I don't believe that this is the future. I don't believe that our lives will be totally dominated by screens for the rest of time. I believe that we'll have enchanted objects, enchanted chairs, enchanted tables, enchanted stores, and that is how we will enchant the future. So the future of connected clothing will definitely start with sportswear, as you've seen. There are many products already in the market, Athos, OmSignal, and they are selling rapidly. They're using intuitive technologies to help high-performance athletes. What we want to do is to add that touch of femininity and for it not just to be about high performance, but for it to be about lifestyle. So we've created a product which is called Nadi. Nadi is about that external communication and being in the full force of flow. It is targeted towards yoga to start with, but as you've seen with athleisure, that market is booming into all walks of life. So what the pants do is they use directional haptic feedback, which is vibration, and it corrects your hips, your knees, and your ankles into the correct pose. If you know much about the emerging market for yoga users, it's enormous. So something like a million users have yoga apps in the US already. So technology and yoga wouldn't necessarily be your traditional path, but we're seeing that that's exactly what the new consumers are wanting. What I found really interesting about athleisure in general is last year in the US, it was the first time it actually outsold denim. And that is a totally unexpected phenomena. I've worked with a lot of trend forecasters. In fact, that's what I thought I was going to do with my future. Um, and so many people didn't predict how enormous tights were going to be. They thought it would be a one season fad, but it's continued to surprise everybody. So we've had quite a large amount of success. We released at the Consumer Electronics Show, which is called CES in Las Vegas. They used to call that Geeks and Freaks Week. Um, and what we did is we had a like, ridiculous amount of press come through the space. We curated a space with Refinery29. They're the fastest emerging fashion media platform in the US. And we selected 50 companies that really speak to the female millennial. And we designed her apartment with those technologies in place our yoga product being in there. We recently had a shout out from Jimmy Fallon. I don't know if you know who he is. He hosts a very important show in the US. Um, and his comments were, of course, very entertaining. But we were included in his monologue. So following that, we have created, and this is all in the last two months, by the way, um, we have created a product which is about experiential design. So we're really designing for the future of fandom. Uh, and we released a product during Super Bowl, and I'm going to show you that video. Hey, I'm Billy Whitehouse from Wearable Experiments. Wearable Experiments design and build hardware, software and apparel. We're here on the field today because we're building this out for football in the US. So on three, we're going to try a rehearsal, okay? Caroline, just move a touch to your right. Perfect. So as a wearable tech company, we've decided to use the skin as an interface, which means that we send emotions direct to the skin using haptic feedback. Our fan jersey connects you to the emotions of your favorite sports team. You're able to feel all the positive things that are happening with your most favorite team, live. Pretty cool stuff. Whatever the football player feels, you'll feel. The vibrations will happen on your jersey simultaneously with the player on the field. It's pretty, pretty, pretty nifty idea. I like it. I wish I thought of it. <laughs> so what happens is you select which team you want to follow inside the app. And then when you've selected the team, you get the sensations of what that team is going through, whether it's heartbeat or acceleration, or any sort of excitement that happens when they score a touchdown. You then feel that excitement live as the game is happening. I'm Matt Davis with Bud Innovations. We're here in the immersion area of our Bud Light Hotel. We have wearable experiments here with us today. We have these jerseys that interact live with the game. 
I've been a fan of football forever, and this is the first time I actually feel like I'm a part of the game with this fan jersey. I know this is the future of fandom. It really puts the consumer in the moment and allows us to leverage our brand in a way that we haven't before. We see this fan jersey as the fourth dimension of entertainment, and we're really excited to be here in the US. If you want to know more, go to wearableexperiments.com. Thank you. Um, so while designing for the skin as an interface, we've actually discovered it's the largest organ on our body, and it's very underutilized as something that we actually send information back to. Uh, currently, there's a lot of space research going into how we use the skin as the newest form of communication. And I'm sure, as you've seen, everything that happens in those kinds of industries then filters down into the commercial reality. For us, what was really important is that we enhance the fans' experience. So rather than it being about just the high-end athlete, it really was about the general population who really care about sport. What we found is that children love it. I don't know if you've ever experienced how they respond to vibration on their body, but it's an obsession. Um, women were really intuitive about it. It felt like they were getting inf more information about a game that they didn't always necessarily understand. Um, and of course, the high intensity fan um, was extremely impressed because they could then send an impact to one of their friends. So we built the hardware, the software, and the apparel. Um, which in itself is a very complex project. We run four projects at once. So there's an industrial design project, there's a software project, there's a hardware and firmware project, and then there's the apparel design project. Um, so it isn't just me. I couldn't do it all on my own. I have an immense team of very intelligent people, um, and they have allowed us to become a pioneer in the apparel space. We do full integration. Uh, so instead of it as it was in the past being removable and rechargeable, it's now fully integrated into the clothing. So recently, we were recognized in Paris at Showroom Privé, which is one of the most international, world-renowned awards for a designer. Um, and we won the first ever wearable award in Paris, uh, which for me was a phenomenal feat, fashion being my background and finally being recognized by the industry properly. So what is the future of fandom? Um, and it's really changing because it is related to retail as much as it is to fashion and to sports. It is one. It is about experiential design and it's about changing and surprising people. Uh, so what we've decided to do is design for all five senses. Smell, taste, touch, sound, sight. Um, and to really activate a memorable experience, you have to stimulate more than one sense at, the, at one time. So sight and sound sometimes will trigger a memory. Sight, smell and sound is three times more likely to trigger a memory. Hence, where you add sight, smell, sound and touch, you're four times more likely to trigger a memory. So this was a display that we were working on inside a stadium that actually has holograms. Holograms that move and change depending on what's going on in the game. Yes, that is a three-dimensional space, and we use a diagonal screen to be able to create the hologram inside. That is then speaking direct to the jersey that the fans are wearing who are walking around the space. But you see, it has the nostalgia. It feels like an art gallery. You'll see, as retail begins to change, it's not going to be about how many clothes you can put into a store. It's far more about curation. It's far more about experience. It's creating those memories for your customers so they come back again and again. So this is what the software looks like. Inside the app, you select which team you'd like to follow, and then you have those sensations play out along your chest. My favorite part about this was actually working with consumers to understand what it means to them to be a part of an experience and what they care about. So they care about the celebration dance. This is really important. Do you know what the Nene is? Of course. So we had to have them do the Nene inside the app because that is what they want. So for us, it's always about consumers first. We ask questions to them and we answer with design and technology. We had the most like, incredible start to this year. So in January, it was CES. In February, it was the Super Bowl. March, I'm here. In April, we'll be launching our first consumer trials of Nadi. Um, and going through this year, we're going to be launching a campaign in UEFA for Europe for football. And these are the lessons that we've learned, not just over the last two months, but over the last three and a half years, is that you can't put the technology before the human experience. So you have to not just think about the problem that you're trying to solve, but the emotions that surround your consumers when they're inside your space or when they're wearing your clothing. Why are they putting that on? What do they feel when they put that on? And if you take the technology away, you add it with that enchantment. So secondly, 
we all know how important data is now. Um, but as a fashion designer, no one tells you how important the data is when you're studying. And so you really have to design for the full spectrum. And you have to understand and research the data. So you have to design for those data outputs while you're building it. And I think as a wearable technologist, you don't even realize you're doing that. You're thinking about sensors, you're thinking about collecting data, but you actually don't even know what that data might lead to. Because now there are more sensors being produced than babies born, there is an exponential growth in the amount of data we have. Currently, we don't have the supercomputers to process all of that data. In fact, I did read recently that they're running out of the alloy metal to create that supercomputer. Um, so we have interesting challenges to face around this. But as a designer and as retailers, you really need to think about what are the data inputs and outputs that you're really looking for and design for that experience from day one. Otherwise, you're going to get so much data, it's going to be useless. And then really design for physical touch and emotions and movement and softness. This is something that I don't think wearables are doing very well. I call the majority of wearables the arm party because they all sit on your wrist and none of them communicate with each other. So that's a solo arm party. What we really need to be doing is thinking about the movement of software and the movement of design so it has this soft and communicatable devices with one another in a global platform. And you'll see many, many companies are starting to get into this. As a side gig, I actually consult for a predictive analytics company, um, mostly because I now understand and value the importance of all this data. The problem being, most consumers don't care about data. They don't understand what it really means. Um, so we have to start considering how you make data sexy and how you get away from traditional infographics and make it really personal and emotional. So my main mission is how do we design for touch in a digital age? Our lives are faster than they have ever been before. We are so active, we are moving so quickly, and living in a city like New York, it's almost unfathomable how fast it really is. Um, so we have to think about touch in this new age of digital life. And then these are the things that I think are mostly forgotten when it comes to technology. How do you design for discovery? Because that is one of the things of the human experience that we really enjoy, whether it's discovering something for yourself or discovering that emotional feeling you get from a piece of technology. And we're often told, especially by Apple, the leaders in this space, that simplicity is the only way forward. And I believe this. Um, but I think you've got to design for complexity as well, because we are very complex humans. Um, and for us, as Australians, we think you have to have a sense of humor. When designer technology gets too serious, people don't like it anymore. They, they stop being so interested. So for us, we have a saying, you have to take the piss out of yourself. Uh, so that is all I have for you today, but I wanted to hope that you would all follow us on social media because uh, this year is going to be an immense year for us. So we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on Snapchat. Um, and please come and ask me any questions about wearable technology. We have, um, we have a very exciting year ahead. Thank you. We are going to open the house up for questions. Same uh, rules of the game. Raise your hand, tell us about who you are and where you're from so we can plot you in the graph and answer your question. Just one quick question, believe it's, it's haptic perception, no, in your wearable technology. So what happens when the team loses? <laughs> I ask because India has this enormously crazy cricket fan base, and I really can't imagine what would happen if they lost the game and everyone felt equally bad. We'd probably be tearing down the stadium. So do you also feel negative emotion? It depends on the sport. So depending on where we're focusing, for NFL, we didn't want to focus on any of the negative ac aspects. So it was all about positive action. Uh, but what we were looking to do in cricket, actually, was add it as a sixth sense. So using predictive analytics to tell you what might happen. Uh, so instead of it being that despair that you'd feel on your body, it'd be that sense of adrenaline and excitement. So you do have something like this for cricket? Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> what about pricing? Where does pricing fit into this? So the jersey is around $200 a unit. Uh, and that's a reasonably commercial rate in the US especially. And for the women's wear, do you, do you price it at a premium or is it more It's a less similar price range. It's a similar yeah. price range. Okay, let's open it up for questions, please. Uh, the lady at the back, can we get her a mic? Hi, Billy. What an inspirational presentation. Thank I'm you. Sonia Kriplani. I head uh, Governance and Policy for Change in Design and Innovation. Um, I just am very curious, in the Middle East and here, we're working with several designers who are using um, the same sort of wearable technology, but to kind of find solutions instead of just experiences. For example, the designers are working to make the shela, which is the, what the Arab girls wear on the head, a little cooler. Their designers are wearing patches, are creating patches to actually make uh, 
jerseys that can keep mosquitoes off in certain areas. How do you use the technology that you have built so beautifully in something to create solutions? Because design, after at the end of the day, is about creating solutions for people. So I think it, it always depends on the customer. Um, so you have to spend time with them, and to be perfectly honest, you have to love them. I hear so many brands say, like, make the customer love us, but I don't think that's the right way around. I actually think it has to be about you loving them. Um, and when you do, truly, then you're designing for their experience and not your own. Um, so I think the, the temperature sensors and the cooling mechanisms are really valuable. I, I was recently in the Middle East, actually, and designing an experience for a, a large expo um, that happens. And we were thinking about how to maximize their experience, but also enhance. So things that, like the cooling, things like smell as a directional tool, um, things like edible elements. <laughs> um, you have to get as wild and wonderful to then reduce it back. I call it thinking future back, um, so that you've, you've got the really wacky ideas and then you just pull off the pieces that aren't necessarily relevant right now and then you have them for later. Brilliant, thank you. Pleasure. Any questions from this side, maybe? Anyone? Can we get a mic to whoever might have a question? No? I think your presentation was all encompassing. <laughs> Everyone's sort of sitting back and just soaking it in. But tell us a little bit, Billy, about um, the inspiration, really, the first spark that set you thinking off this way. I know you talked about your experience in New York, but you had done some work before that. Yeah. Um, so it really did come from education. I was, um, I was invited to do a design residency with Shapeways, the 3D printing company, and I was researching and experimenting with all different types of 3D printing solutions. So 3D printing in a knit, where it becomes an apparel piece itself. Uh, and then looking into the software solutions around that as well. So I was looking into how students evolve and what software solutions are they using as designers, but also just as students. Um, and connecting those dots allowed me to start speaking the language. And to be perfectly honest, I had no idea how to build it, not a clue. I just knew that I spoke the language enough that I knew that it was possible. And it really was just the imagination piece that allowed me to start piecing those things together and then saying to my co-founder, I think I've got something. And him saying, yeah, yeah, that's possible. We can do that. It's easy. So aside from the alert shirt, because there's a lot of retailers gathered here this afternoon, tell us a little bit about how this could take on, uh, first of all, a mass scale, and second of all, return sales. Because for some people, it might be that you acquired the jacket and you're good to go. You don't want to make any more purchases. How do you sort of get that cycle moving? It's funny. I think, again, the consumers are always so different depending on where you are. Um, and our jacket does have removable and replaceable, but it has different designs depending on the city because of the climate, because of the people, because of how you want to feel in that city. Uh, and so I know that they're going to continue to purchase. But when it comes to how you activate something inside a retail experience or how you keep bringing people back. It's actually about thinking diff about different business models. So you have to have a business model around your software as much as you do your hardware, as much as you do your apparel. And so there's three different business models running in parallel. Uh, and that is where you can get, either get really interesting, um, or it can, if you're not an expert in it or you're not ready to constantly evolve, um, it might get tricky. For me, the important part is to make sure you're honestly constantly asking the questions back to the consumer. Uh, because we can predict what they want, but it doesn't necessarily mean they do. Uh, so if it is about getting them to return, is it about a different style, or is it about autumn, winter? Or is it purely you want them to download different software? Um, and then how do you create that business model around that? Any more questions before, yeah, can we get the gentleman a mic, Hello. please? Oh, hi, Billy. Um, Excellent presentation, I must say. Uh, so wearable technology experiences mainly to sports and sport-related uh, activities. Are there any other applications that you're working on currently? Because I, I, I believe there must have been a hell of a lot of R&D that you guys do. You <laughs> talked about hardware, you talked about software, and then you talked about apparel. So, I mean, can you share something in terms of what the future holds <laughs> for wearable? Uh, I, can, I can share some. Okay, great. Um, what I think is really interesting is the feminine hygiene market. I think that's going to be an enormous play for wearable technology. Um, we, we have an understanding of sensors, but truly there's very few people who really know the capacity of what they can do. 
Um, and then beyond just the sensor, how do you feed that information back to the human? Um, so software and apps aren't really enough anymore because we're so distracted by them. So you'll, you know that everyone uses Facebook first. Um, and so if they're not going to your app, how do you then drive them back to your app from Facebook? Uh, so for me, that information has to go back onto the body. So how do we create that information system? Um, another area is a swimwear for an Australian. We, we care very much about swimwear. Um, it's not a direct area for us, but they're two areas that we're definitely looking into. And of course, there is so much R&D, and no one really has time to do it all. So you need a team of people who can, who can assist you there. Mm. I, think, I believe that sports is just the beginning, um, and that it's the gateway to where this market can really go. You know, the two tracks of debate we've had so far at this conference, Billy, is one about technology, and the other is that India is in the throes of this online versus offline debate. Now, for a product like yours, as you said, it's visual, it's auditory, it's kinesthetic, it's tactile. Does that make an offline uh, offering more important, or do you guys, can you go online with this product only? I have the similar debate. <laughs> um, I actually think you can go online as much as you can offline. Uh, but I don't believe that I belong on a rack next to every other jacket. And so I don't necessarily think that I belong on an e-commerce site next to every other jacket. There is a magic of what our products can do that traditional retailers aren't necessarily doing right now. Um, so for me, a lot of what you see when you're buying online is a single static image that you can, oh, front, back, behind, you can then see. What I'd like to see is far more animated GIFs. So you can see, oh, what does this product do? Videos are too long and you lose people after 30 seconds anyway. Um, so for me, the, the really important part is how do we create that magic online with animated GIFs, with Snapchats, with all the parts that our consumers are really purchasing through. Wonderful. It's been such a pleasure having you Thank on you. stage. Ladies and gentlemen, another very warm round of applause, please. I'm so <laughs> sorry we're out of time, but you can catch her right after this. Thank you very, very much for joining us this pleasure. afternoon. My absolute pleasure.